When I first started teaching 22 years ago, I thought it would be important to cover the Electoral College in my courses, but that probably not many students would be very interested in it. Then came the recount in Florida in 2000, Bush threading the Ohio needle in 2004, Trump's minority victory in 2016, and now, well, things just keep getting weirder and weirder. So in the wake of a presidential election in 2020 that engaged a variety of obscure aspects of the Electoral College system, leading to a mob attack on the US Capitol and the impeachment trial of a former president with persistent political polarization that indicates we may not yet be out of strange times. I'm very pleased to help facilitate what promises to be a fascinating panel discussion on all things Electoral College related. We have with us this evening a very distinguished panel of experts. I might even be so bold as to say you could not find a better panel of experts who are equipped to answer just about any question you have on this system. Let me do some brief introductions. Dr. Gary Gregg holds the Mitchell McConnell Chair in Leadership at the University of Louisville and is director of the McConnell Center. He is the author or editor of 10 books, including Securing Democracy, Why We Have an Electoral College. He has appeared on numerous national and international television programs, radio programs, and in periodicals, including the New York Times. He won the George Washington Medal for Public Communication, and each year he serves as lead faculty and director for a 30-day immersion program for mid-career Army officers and later career NCOs. He'll be talking to us about the Framer's vision for the Electoral College and how the institution contributes to our system today. Dr. John Fortier is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on Congress and elections, election administration, election demographics, voting and absentee voting, the US presidency, and the Electoral College. He was previously the director of governmental studies at the Bipartisan Policy Center and the principal contributor to the AEI Brookings Election Reform Project. He is the author and editor of <clears throat> After the People Vote, a guide to the Electoral College. He has been published in scholarly journals and the popular press, including Politico and The Hill, and is a frequent guest on just about every news program you can think of. He'll be talking to us about what happens in our system after the votes are cast on election day, all that mysterious stuff that happens between election day and the inauguration. Dr. James Piffner is university professor emeritus in the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. His areas of expertise include the US presidency, the national security policymaking process, and public management. His professional experience includes service in the director's office of the US Office of Personal Management. He has written or edited 16 books on the presidency and American national government, including The Strategic Presidency, Hitting the Ground Running, and Organizing the Presidency with Stephen Hess, and I think it's fair to say that those two books are the standard texts on presidential transitions. He has also published more than 100 scholarly articles and chapters and books. Perhaps most impressive, while serving with the 25th Infantry Division in 1970, he received the Army Commendation Medal for Valor in Vietnam and Cambodia. Mm -hmm. He'll be talking to us about what happened this year with various efforts to interfere with the normal process, the implications for democratic legitimacy and possible reform options. Finally, it's my pleasure to introduce our primary student moderator. Zach Neely is a senior at Trinity University, majoring in political science with a minor in history. He is currently serving as the vice president for the Trinity University chapter of Young Americans for Liberty, a national organization dedicated to identifying, educating, training, and mobilizing young activists to advance libertarian causes. He was deeply involved last semester in the TU election initiative, a committee of students, faculty, and administrators dedicated to engaging students in politics. He will perform the unenviable task of feeding your questions to our panelists. So very quickly here, how's the evening, how the evening is going to work. Each of our three panelists will speak in turn in the order of their introductions, taking 10 to 15 minutes each to tell us everything we wanted to know about the Electoral College, but we're afraid to ask. As you think of questions, please use the Q&A function to list them, not the chat feature. When Dr. Piffner wraps up his talk, then Zach will serve as the moderator feeding questions from the Q&A to our panelists. If you have a question you want one specific panelist to respond to, feel free to indicate who that is, but you also may be interested in what all these scholars have to say, and we're going to encourage them to interact with each other as much as they want to. There's no fear of fisticuffs in a Zoom panel after all. Once we near the end of our time, I'll call for the last question and then we'll wrap up. 
And so with that, I will let Dr. Greg take it away. Dr. Greg. Thank you, Dr. Crockett. Thanks for having me, uh, Trinity uh, University. It's great to be here. It's great to be part of this, uh, this panel um, with uh, two very distinguished uh, experts on the presidency uh, today. So my task is to, um, to talk about the origins of Electoral College. How did we get here? Uh, how do we find ourselves in this strange institution that we have? Uh, so I'm going to try to untangle that a little bit and, um, and maybe how we've evolved uh, just, uh, just a little bit. So we go back to the American founding. I want you to be thinking about uh, the founding period. I want to think about 1787, the summer of 1787. And one of the things I want you to come to understand and uh, sort of realize and put in your um, when you're thinking about this, consider it. And that is when they're creating the American presidency, part of which is creating a selection process uh, for the person that would serve in the office. They were creating an office unlike had ever been seen in human history, really. There's not a model for an independent executive that is also Republican. We can make a monarch, sure, easy, simple that. We can make a king, um, very easy. An emperor is probably even easy. We have a lot of historical examples of that. But they're trying to create something that really is new. And, um, and that's, I think, that's, think about that when you're, when you're doing it. Because when we go back and we look at some, we look in history, I think so many of us look back and say, well, obviously it's going to be like this and this is how you're going to do it. Um, but I think it, it helps us to think about that. Secondly, is I want to say nine things. That was the first thing. Second thing I want to say is that, again, unlike a lot of the rhetoric today, a lot of uh, the way it's taught, it seems to me, is the founders were not consciously making an undemocratic decision in creating the Electoral College. It's often, it's often taught like that, as in uh, the assumption should have been, obviously, uh, there's only one answer. It should be a democratic uh, election, a popular election. And if it's not that, then it's some kind of conspiracy. It's some kind of uh, shenanigans going on or something. Real in reality, it's almost not even a consideration during the found. It is brought up twice, I believe, during the entire summer. The idea of a direct popular election for president. Once is by James Wilson of Pennsylvania. I think they're both Pennsylvanians that brought it up. Might have been Governor Morris. But when James Wilson brought it up and said something like to the rest of the convention, let's let the people decide. Let's have a popular election. And uh, James Madison writes in his notes, the convention was stunned into silence. Right. This is, this is like, what? what? <laughs> Hello? What kind of crazy idea is that? Um, and so it's not really even uh, even considered. So. It's much more complicated than that. The founders are just not simply anti-democratic or undemocratic. Uh, I want you to sort of think about it as not really a considered option in 1787 over a continental, um, what's at that time a continental, they thought of themselves as a continental United States, 13 different states, great diversity um, in those states uh, as well. Third thing uh, I want to say is unlike us today, I think, where we tend to focus on what I'll call inputs into the system, and that is we focus on the process of getting a president. They were focused on that, yes, but they were more focused on, more concerned, let's say, about the outputs. And that is getting the person, the type of person to be president right, was more important than getting the inputs right. I hope that might make some sense. I might come back to it here uh, in a minute. But what they were trying to do, as, uh, as Alexander Hamilton says in Federalist 68, was to create a system where some fit person or some fit man, I think he said, uh, would be selected as president. So that fitness for office was important. The um, having an office holder that was virtuous, just, patriotic, wise, and independent. And that independence is going to come back here uh, in, uh, in just a moment. So again, they were focused on that output. Many of us today, we talk about the debates about the Electoral College focus on inputs. And that is, should we just have a direct election? Without the question of how would any of our changes uh, that we would make change 
the kind of the output, the kind of person that we would have in office. So I think that might be useful to throw that into our conversation uh, today, or at least understand it, that that's part of their uh, concerns at the time. The fourth thing I wanna say about it is that it was so complicated, so difficult, uh, and that is the creation of a selection process to get that right output, that they ended up changing the process over and over and over and over again throughout the summer of 1787 at the Constitutional Convention. And what would surprise most people today, I think it would kind of be a shock probably to most people today, the dominant, where they landed the most um, during that summer was actually on legislative selection of the president. That is Congress would choose the president whether that be the House or the Senate or a combination of both or a committee of, the, uh, of Congress, but it was legislative selection. That's where they landed most of the time. And now instantly today, anybody that's taken basic American government, Red Federal is 51 maybe, knows alarm bells are going off, right? That's a complete violation of separation of powers, complete violation of checks and balances, Ambition may be made to counteract ambition, as Madison says, in 51. And they knew it uh, as well, that, that, that probably is not going to work because if you had Congress choosing the president, then Congress would dominate the president. The president wouldn't be independent, wouldn't be able to make their own decisions on vetoes and other, uh, and, and, uh, other powers, but would be beholden to Congress. So, and when they did that, I can just slight more detail on it. When, whenever they voted for that system, legislative selection, it was always within a context. The context was always a single term, or almost always, I think it was every time, but um, if it might, might, have been, uh, might have been one difference or something. But it was almost always in the context of a single term for president and a long term for president. So maybe let's say a model might be a president is selected by Congress, for one term of a six year term. That gave them a little bit of independence because he got six years there. And most importantly, they could not run again. They could not ask Congress for the office again, which meant the Congress would have a little less power over them. But still, it's, that violates other problems, all right? That, that violates just the pure uh, democratic process of allowing the, the people or the electors, whoever's choosing, choose who they want because they'll have one, that, that term limit would be one term and then out. Uh, that's, a, that's a problem. It's still also a problem for, um, for independence um, for the president. It doesn't, solve, it doesn't solve that. At the end of the day, it also, it also is a... Um, Hamilton writes in The Federalist, one of the great uh, checks on presidential abuse of power is having to stand for, for another. That being Recording a lame duck for the entire term. Uh, in other words, you're gonna think about it that way. So it was complicated. In other words, legislative selection was the dominant uh, way at the end, at the very end of the convention, they created this thing we call the Electoral College as a way to get out of that, but still have some kind of um, elite selection for the president. So here's how that works. This is number six point. What did they create? They created a system that would, <clears throat> would, would find itself sitting upon, if you will, the foundation would be independent bodies. We call it the Electoral College. Now, there is no Electoral College. Um, I do some work for the State Department in the Middle East and was asked the question um, in, in the, during, the, during December. It was like, well, can't the Electoral College just step in and fix all this? Uh, so I try to explain to a foreign audience that's not really how it happens and what the Electoral College is. You guys hopefully know a little bit better than that. The elect they settled upon this system of Electoral College that would be based in the states. It would work like this. The state legislatures would select a mechanism. Uh, they might select themselves. They can come up with some other mechanism to select 
a, I hate to use the word elite because it's got a bad connotation today, but that's, a, that's what they were talking about. They would select an elite group of citizens, an elite group of leaders in their state who would meet in, a, in their state and would meet under conditions of deliberation. I'm going to come back to deliberation. I think it's really important to understand here as well. I'll come back to that in a minute. So the state legislatures were to choose these, what we call them electors. They would meet in a, in a room someplace and, uh, and deliberate. They would discuss the candidates, discuss the best people in the country to be president. They would then each cast two votes for the two best people in the United States. If you don't know this, this is going to be a shock to you too, because it's so different than what we have today. They would vote for the two best people in the United States to be president. This is how we get in 1796, Thomas, or, uh, uh, John Adams as president, and Thomas Jefferson, not allies, not running on a ticket, not part of the same political uh, persuasion, if you will, one become president, one become vice president. Because it kind of worked. That is, arguably the two best people besides Washington in the country to be president are John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, and they are, uh, they are elected president and vice president. So they were to vote, collect all the votes, send them to the Capitol. Uh, the votes are counted. Whoever gets the majority becomes president. The second runner up becomes vice president. That's the way it was supposed to work. If, it, if there's no majority, then it's, they were, uh, the House would choose the president. The Senate would choose the vice president. Well, there's details to that. Ask in your uh, Q&A. We can talk about the details of all that. But I know I'm going to run out of time in my opening remarks here. So uh, I'm going to push on. That's the basic kind of system that they created. The sixth thing I want to say is what can we learn from that? Just by under, uh, understanding that now, what might you take away from that? Uh, well, first thing I think you're going to take away, and I, I apologize, Dr. Crockett, for throwing this out. Those of you that are college students, do not report this to your parents, because I'll make you come home if you're learning this. Do not report this, all right? You have no constitutional right to vote for president, right? The electoral college, the system, the constitutional system is not based constitutionally in you having a right to vote. It is up to the state legislatures who have decided over time to make this a democratic process and let the people vote. That's not your legal constitutional right um, as it was set up in the constitution. So again, don't report that at home. That's just for our information right here. B, second thing, 6B, I would say, again, I'll go back to outputs. Uh, the concern is really about outputs and almost any input would do if it got the right output. And that is virtuous, independent, wise, just leader who are going to serve the public good as president. Again, I think I want to contrast that with us because almost all of our debates are simply on the input side. And that is should we have electors? Should they be allowed to vote the way they want? Should we have a direct popular election, et cetera? Maybe let's throw out the question of what kind of system is going to give us better presidents. Unless you think the, pres the last few presidents that we have had are the best people in the United States, we got some room to work uh, maybe on that. C uh, 6C is deliberation. I want to come back to that word deliberation because it is it is so undervalued. In fact, it's a bad word, it seems to me, today in American politics. Um, they really built a system, I believe, hoping for deliberation in the Electoral College, but also in the entire system was supposed to be based on deliberation. Uh, and that is honest, give and take discussions, not simply pulling the lever for a party, not simply doing what your party wants you to do. So I think we this uh, we can use this to go back and revisit what I think is a vital word that I wish we would, uh, we would, we would reward from our politicians a little bit more in America today. Number seven thing, it doesn't work the way it was intended. You know it doesn't work the way I just laid it out. Um, it is now a democratic system, I will say, 50 states and the District of Columbia. So it doesn't work the way it was intended. Um, and uh, you cannot defend the Electoral College as it works today from the founding vision. You can take bits and pieces, but not 
totally. The eighth thing I want to say is the 12th Amendment ruined everything. So remember that 12th Amendment ruined everything. If you if you are a fan of the Hamilton video movie or I mean film ah play, there's a song about it in there. So you can go back. Even if I'm boring you right now, go back and watch that. It's historically wrong, that song or this misleading. But nonetheless, uh, go back and look at it. the election of 1800. Hamilton is a hero in this. I think the bottom line is remember what I just I just laid out. The electors were to vote twice for two people. Uh, the best person, the second best person. By 1800, we were developing the sort of a part of fractionalizing the party system. And so Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr kind of ran together. So all of their electors voted for Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. Well, what that meant at the end of the day is they tied. Well, what do you do in a in case of a tie? The House of Representatives chooses the president. 35 ballots, 36 ballots later, um, and Hamilton's intervention, and we eventually get Thomas Jefferson as president, but it is a crisis. And so we passed the 18th, or the 12th, I'm sorry, the 12th Amendment in 1804. Here's what that does when I say it ruins everything, is it eliminates the idea that these electors are going to be independent, deliberative, um, deliberative leaders, and it settles us constitutionally basically into a party system because candidates are going to run after 1800 then as under the 12th Amendment as a ticket. So that's why we have a president, vice president as a ticket, because the 12th Amendment uh, eliminated the two votes for president and said you get one vote for president, one vote for vice president. So, again, that changed it dramatically. And I think, as I'll say, it, it ruined, uh, ruined everything. The ninth and last thing, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to pass this on to more interesting uh, contemporary thing. The ninth thing I want to say is it does not function uh, today, uh, as I said, the way it was intended, but that does not mean it is not functioning in a way that is, agree with it or disagree with it, hugely consequential. And I think as Dr. Crockett pointed out, if we were teaching this in the 90s, most people would not understand that, moment wouldn't care. Even most of the 2000s, frankly. But after 2016 and 2020, I think in particular, everybody knows uh, the Electoral College is pretty consequential. And I think we're going to talk about that uh, as, uh, as we go on uh, this evening. So I hope that gives you a little bit better idea of where this thing came from and, uh, and maybe how it was intended to function and how it is, uh, is developed. Thank you, Dr. Greg. Uh, Dr. Fortier, take us away to the next step. Yes, so well, first, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate uh, being here almost, almost in San Antonio, but uh, with, with all of you. Um, let me say a few things. First, uh, thank you for the introduction. One thing I will note is that I started my career at the American Enterprise Institute, and then I left and went to the Bipartisan Policy Center for about nine years, and I've just come back in the last couple of weeks. And I'm using that to explain the the bio photo that you saw, which looks like uh, it's not taken yesterday. So it was, uh, it was from my previous time there and uh, uh, I've aged a bit. Uh, let me also say something about the, um, the book that I have, and I know Gary Gregg also has a book on the Electoral College, which I recommend, uh, but a, a book called After the People Vote. And it's a book that, that I've been fortunate to edit the last two editions of, one that has just come out, but it's a book that goes back quite a ways uh, in, in my, teacher and former colleague, Walter Burns, uh, started this project in the, in the 1970s. And it was, it was a thinner book then, but the, the core of it was uh, still called After the People Vote was really to explain all of the mechanisms that happened uh, after this popular vote election in November and how we eventually led to uh, a new president taking office on January 20th. Uh, the book has certainly other historical essays about you know, contested elections and a new, a new uh, chapter on uh, public opinion of the Electoral College and some pro and con essays, but the core really still is what Walter put together. We've been updating for years with, with developments about you know, what, what all of these processes are. And so what I'm going to do is to, to walk through some of them and especially highlight where you know, they've come up this year and, and where we've either learned things or, um, or at least we, <laughs> we, we, we address certain issues that we don't always address. Uh, so quickly, a, a very quick timeline of, of what happens. Uh, first, I guess, starting slightly before the election, uh, state parties are uh, selecting slates of electors to be associated with presidential candidates. And so when you vote 
in November, as, as, as Gary Gregg uh, alluded to, you're not voting for uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden. You're actually voting for these, these people in your state, uh, a, a slate of people associated with, with Joe Biden, if you're voting for the Democratic ticket, or uh, Donald Trump for the Republican ticket. They're selected in advance. We have the election. The election process, again, uh, you know, in the past, we did have directly appointed electors by state legislatures, but for a very long time, we've had these elections. And the, elect, the elections are resolved by the states. And I think that's important, and this comes up later. The states have different processes in their, in their states as to how they run elections. They, you know, we had all sorts of disputes about this, but it's not uniform. And ultimately the states through their processes come to a resolution of who won the election in their state and therefore which set of electors to, to appoint officially to be <laughs> part of what we call the electoral college informally. Um, that process goes on and it could go on. Some states you saw resolve their elections pretty quickly in a week. Sometimes we had recounts and court challenges, but it does have a, an end point of sorts, or at least I think it should have an end point. Uh, and we, we, we resolved those elections in the states, appointed electors, they met on December 14th. They cast these, these ballots, which are then sent to Washington. Uh, January 3rd, just to note, uh, a new Congress comes in and this is something that's changed over the years. Historically, when we passed the 20th Amendment, before that, it used to be the old Congress, the lame duck Congress. But here we do have the new Congress, the one elected in November, showing up on January 3rd. And then on January 6th, and, and people I'm sure know this all too well for unfortunate reasons, there's the counting of the electoral votes in Congress. Um, potentially challenges, and we can talk about those. Uh, if, if there's a winner, um, we're just gonna have a winner and that person is gonna take office on January 20th at noon. If for some reason we don't have someone with a majority of the electors cast, then we're gonna go to a, a, a contingent election, one in the House and one in the Senate. I won't get into all the details, but there's a lot of machinery that, ha that, that is there between November and January 20th. And again, I, you know, there, there's a lot to talk about. I, I know I had some reporters calling me and saying, look, I like your book, but it could be a lot longer. We could, we could talk about some of these issues in greater detail, and, and I think we could. So I'm gonna to try to tick off a few things that either happened or didn't happen, and, and hopefully in the, in the, the um, uh, questions, we can, we can get to more of them. You know, the first one uh, is one that we didn't talk as much about, but that is the question of faithless electors. It's a term that people use if those electors who show up on December 14th don't vote the way you expect them to. Don't vote the way the, the state prescribed. The state said Donald Trump won the election. These, these electors are appointed for him and we expect them to vote for Donald Trump. They vote for someone else. Uh, we've in the past had some relatively small number of people being faithless electors, usually as protest votes. Um, <laughs> we had a big effort in 2016 uh, for, for some to persuade some of the electors, maybe they should defect from Donald Trump and vote for others. Uh, the one interesting development this time actually happened before the election is that we had a, a major Supreme Court case in the summer, uh, which determined a question. And I frankly was a little surprised at the decision, but uh, it, it, uh, states have been over the years trying to do various things to, to bind their electors, to keep their electors from, from casting these votes that they're not supposed to cast. Um, and the, the most recent twist, the most consequential twist is some states, uh, 16 or so, along with some administrative uh, powers to do so in some states, are, are allowed to now bind the electors so strongly that if you vote the wrong way, they, they take you off the panel and they put someone else on and they, they have someone vote the right way. So essentially not allowing the, their electors to ever vote in the, in the wrong way. Um, the court upheld this. And so we do have a number of states now who have pretty airtight ways of binding their electors, although we don't have them in all states and there's still some other issues. But that was a significant decision that happened over the summer. Interestingly, of course, when we got to December 14th, we didn't have any faithless electors. So it didn't, it didn't come up in this way as it has in the past, but there was, there was you know, Supreme Court action. Um, I think another question that came up in a couple of ways, and that gets back to, again, what, uh, something Gary alluded to, that you know, the ultimate body that's in charge of selecting these electors is the state legislature. Um, what that means is a little controversial or people can argue about it, but certainly early on in our history, 
Many state legislatures just directly appointed electors. We didn't have popular elections. Uh, then you know, we moved to popular elections, but there's still this you know, concern uh, that what if uh, somehow the, the state passes electoral law, but a judge or someone does something that really distorts what the electoral system is. Do those state legislatures have some power to, to come back in, maybe point to slate of electors? That, that came up, we come back to that. But even before that, maybe, maybe the Supreme Court might be able to step in and protect the state legislature. And we had some cases about this. It didn't get as far as it might have, but uh, the case in Pennsylvania in particular, uh, the, the Supreme Court had been striking down federal uh, court judges who had been changing the electoral, the deadlines for when absentee ballots were, were due, for example. But they, dec they declined to do so in Pennsylvania when it was a state Supreme Court that came up and said, you know, our, they, they essentially moved the, the, the deadline by which uh, ballots could be received, uh, citing the pandemic and some other factors. And some thought the court should step in and some of the members of the court voted that way. And Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts uh, went um, more on the, the state side in that case. And so we didn't, we didn't get there, but certainly that issue is sort of lingering in the background. Is there, is there a way which a court, Supreme Court might step in if for somehow they feel the, a, a state judge or some other actor other than the state legislature is really distorting the electoral code? Um, going a little bit further, uh, aside from all the, the actual recounts and, and uh, judicial challenges we had, there's this point of could these state legislators or legislatures appoint electors directly, even though they had an election already. We had an election, we, we saw this, or we saw, we, we saw issue of uh, people pushing for this. Um, the argument would be, and we saw this argument raised in Florida in 2000, that again, somehow there was some great distortion of the electoral code made and that the state legislature needs to step back in and appoint electors directly. Again, very controversial, didn't happen, but people pushed for it. Um, what did happen, which is, which is um, not unprecedented, but, but um, you know, is, is a very strange matter is that we had some states uh, and, and it wasn't even clear exactly how many, but certainly uh, some of the close states like Arizona and Georgia and Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, where some people, sometimes they were losing electors, sometimes they were just random people, uh, stepped in and showed up on December 14th and cast some electoral ballots as if they were the electors. And some of them said, we're actually doing this knowing that we're really not the electors, but we think later on a court or someone, maybe a governor or state legislature is gonna step back in and say, Actually, Donald Trump won the election, uh, even though the election looks like it went one way and we're, we're December 14th and the electors are voting, uh, there's a dispute that which, which could be resolved later. And so we're waiting, we're waiting for someone to give us that, that sanction that, that we're the real electors. And so we're casting our votes here. Now, now, ultimately that didn't happen. The state didn't step in. And I think that's probably a good thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, there is this theory and it's based on a very, so obscure precedent back in Hawaii in 1961, where uh, there was a recount in Hawaii, which wouldn't have changed the election between Nixon and Kennedy, but did change the results in that state where later on a, a governor certified that, that the, the electors were uh, Kennedy's rather than Nixon's. And so they were relying on that precedent, didn't happen. Um, the next date that I think obviously everybody is pointing to, of course, is January 6th. And you know this of course is, you know, terrible, tragic date, and, and you know, especially I think for some of us watching and following the Electoral College minutia, all of a sudden in the middle of, of what is usually a not very well followed process, we had this you know, horrible violence and, and you know, amazingly reconstituted later in the night, it sort of kept going on. But here you have several questions I think that were, that were raised. Um, and some I think were actually, despite all the controversy, you know, resolved in a way that maybe is helpful for the future, but you know, the, the constitution is not very clear about exactly what's gonna happen on January 6th. Um, it says that the vice president or the president of the Senate, who's the vice president in this case, um, presides over the counting and the con essentially the Congress is counting. Uh, 
but the vice president is presiding over this joint session of the House and Senate together. And in this case, uh, the, the question is, well, what's the role of the vice president? And you saw you know, President Trump really pushing uh, Vice President Pence to take an active role, rule on the, that, we, that we throw out some votes or, or make some you know, dramatic rulings which could change the outcome of the election. And, and Pence did a couple of things which I think are interesting. One is he you know, certainly he fulfilled the more normal, traditional, really very administrative role that that vice president usually fills in the chair and, not, and doesn't do much, just simply reads what's there and hears objections and, and allows the House and the Senate to resolve them if they need to by splitting. Um, and so indicated that he was not gonna play that, that role and that that wasn't really appropriate. Uh, the second thing that he did, which was interesting is he, he <laughs> this is kind of technical, but the way he spoke about the electors when he read them, he actually ruled out just random slates of electors being considered. He, he basically indicated here are the slates of electors that have some state action behind them. Uh, and we indicated before that there were these electors who really weren't, didn't have any legitimate sanction. And there was some question, were they gonna be considered at least? We're, we're gonna have to debate this in Congress. And he said, no. Um, obviously we had the, the terrible violence and then we reconstituted. And you know, I won, uh, one question, I think big question that, that um, I don't know if it's resolved, but I think that there's, there, there were some good formulations of what may be appropriate. And I, I point you to Senator Mike Lee, who um, somewhat off the cuff, not as prepared remarks, uh, made an account of you know, when Congress should really be active, if at all, in counting the votes. And his point, and I think this is true constitutionally, is that really Congress is supposed to count the votes. And, and I would say in almost all cases, in 99% of the cases, that's a pretty formal duty. That's just to have the, the numbers read to you and to count them and say they're okay and get to the right number and say, well, we've got a majority. So this person's going to be president in January. Um, but the, um, you know, the, the idea that, they, that there would be objections, um, there is a law that allows objections. And we've had some objections in the past very recent past in 2000, 2017, uh, 2001, 2017, where House members objected. Uh, in 2005, when a, both House members and a Senator objected and we had a debate and you know, some, some votes as to whether these votes in Ohio should be counted. Uh, those were done by um, uh, Democrats in those cases. They weren't as extensive as the, the numbers weren't as large as they were for Republicans in, in 2000. Uh, 21 just now. Uh, certainly the president at the time wasn't you know, pushing that the election wasn't over and that there, there hadn't, hadn't conceded. So there were obvious, obvious differences. But you know, Mike Lee's speech asks, well, when is it really appropriate for Congress to even do much other than just count the votes? And you know, we have a few exceptions might be something to do with the electors themselves, something went wrong. And we saw that back in 1969, there was some question about a faithless elector and the House and Senate debated it, but it was, it, was not really, it was not really overturning the state's will. And so, so I think that's one thing that Mike Lee pointed out that you really generally wanna go with what the state said. They had an election, that's, that's pretty strong. Maybe there's some cases of two sets of electors. We had a horrible election in 1876 where that became an issue. You have a law that tries to prevent that, not perfectly. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's, it's you know, laid out that, that probably we shouldn't have been objecting so much to electors in the, in the 2000s. We really didn't do this for 100 years other than that one time in 1969. And of course, you know, pushing it even further in 2020, it doesn't seem like it's Congress's role to be that active, uh, except in some very, very limited cases. Uh, the last couple of things I'll say, and I'll just, I'll just tick them off because I know I'm running out of time, is uh, you know, one, I do think that um, we are going to have some debate. I know Jim is probably going to talk about reforms more generally, but we're going to have some debate about um, on a smaller level, this Electoral Count Act, how we should count, are there some reforms that will be made there? So I'm, I'm happy to talk about those uh, as well. I also think there was some confusion this year about what would happen if there were some gridlock or, or Congress was unable to agree on counting the votes. And some think that that would mean we would go to the House of Representatives and they would actually elect the president. Then really, it's only in the case where there's not a majority in the, in the um, Electoral College that you get there. Uh, if you just have a deadlock, it's a very bad situation, and arguably you could go all the way up to just January 20th, and I think you'd go to the Presidential Succession Act. Nancy Pelosi would have been president at least for a while. 
Uh, but I, you don't go and just have Congress elect the president unless you actually have a completion of that count and someone does not have a, have a, a, a majority as well. So um, I will stop there. I think those are, those are big points. And again, each one of them, I think a lot of them we could be debating for, for quite a while. Um, and we had, you know, unfortunately more action, I think, than we, <laughs> we usually have, but a lot of issues raised in a way that allows us to think about them. All right, thank you, Dr. Fortier. And we will now let Dr. Pipner wrap things up for us. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. I appreciate uh, being here with the, the two distinguished scholars of the presidency. <clears throat> There's a couple of things, points I wanna make, but first, just briefly on the creation of the Electoral College. Um, uh, Professor uh, or, uh, Gary made some really good points, uh, but just a couple of other points. Uh, one of the key things was, okay, at the, at the end of the summer, uh, the uh, committee on, uh, on detail that decided the president would be chosen by Congress at uh, a seven year term with no, no reelection. But then the Brewery co uh, Committee came up and because as, as he said, uh, they, were, they were afraid that it would give too much power to Congress. And so the uh, Brewery Committee had to come to a compromise and the key compromise was between the large states and the small states, the ratio of uh, people in those were, were 10 to one uh, and that the problem of the, uh, the slave states having three quarters or uh, three fifths uh, could be counted. And so those uh, compromises were made in the Connecticut Compromise. And so the Electoral College was created to build in the small states and the slave states wanted to make sure that they didn't lose uh, the advantages that they had gained in the Connecticut Compromise. Uh, and so they went along with the, the uh, Electoral College of which preserved uh, those uh, those ratios. Uh, also, just uh, the, uh, there were a number of uh, 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 framers who were in favor of a popular election: uh, Governor Morris, James Wilson, James Madison, uh, Dickinson, Daniel Carroll. There are several that are against it. Uh, but if the students uh, want to look at this, uh, go to the uh, Madison's uh, description of the Constitutional Convention, uh, the, the <clears throat> standard uh, uh, Max Rand put these together. So go back there. And if you want to look at the, the executive, just go to the, uh, uh, the index and you can find all of those battles. <laughs> but okay, but more importantly, um, uh, David asked me uh, to address questions of legitimacy. Uh, and in doing this, I'm just gonna look at the most uh, compelling arguments as I see it for, for a popular vote. <clears throat> and it's mainly uh, the problem that uh, five times over our history, the runner up has become president. And so many people say uh, the president should be, the person who gets the most votes should be president. Um, uh, and I think that the key arguments here are, or justifications would be <clears throat> that the president and vice president are the only uh, national uh, officials that rep represent the people. Of course, members of Congress uh, represent states and they represent uh, <clears throat> districts, uh, uh, but the, the president and vice president, the only two that, that represent the nation as a whole. Uh, and also the principle of one person, uh, one vote and the idea that all votes should count equally. <clears throat> uh, secondly, uh, the problem with one of the problems with the Electoral College uh, is that the, can, can, or the, the people who vote for the candidates that lose in the state, their votes are wasted. That is, they're not piled up on the side that they're, they're voting for. They're not added up and they're completely uh, disregarded. So if you're a, a Republican voter in California or New York, uh, your votes are not going to count at all. Or if you're a Democratic voter in Texas, say, or Ohio, your votes are not going to count. At all, and there are five million people that voted for Donald Trump in California this year. Those votes did not count uh, at, at all. <clears throat> now, the Electoral College has been criticized because it it favors the small states because they get those two extra votes uh, representing the. Uh, and their senators in addition to the number of representatives they have. It's also been argued that the Electoral College favors the large states because there's more eggs in that basket and with the unit rule, uh, there's more at, at stake there. <clears throat> but in fact, neither one of these things uh, works out because the Electoral uh, College as it currently, well, in the last several uh, decades, half century, really uh, favors the swing states. And so all, uh, most of the energy of campaigning and, and so forth go into the a small number of states in 2012. Uh, only 12 states got any post-nomination events and they got most of the money was spent in those 12 states. Uh, and in 2020, 90% of all the general campaign events were in these 12 states. And so what this basically does is to ignore uh, you know, the, the small states that are solidly Republican, uh, the states that are solidly Democratic, those are ignored uh, and only the swing states really get um, uh, much attention from presidential candidates. 
<laughs> uh, now, David asked me also to look at uh, reform options. Now there's been more, more than 700 uh, different uh, proposals to change the Electoral College. And I just want to go through some of the, the main ones. <clears throat> Uh, there's what's called the automatic plan. And what that would do is to eliminate uh, electors. And so just automatically put those votes uh, in, in the, uh, uh, for, for the candidate without having electors. And this would uh, eliminate the, the question of a faithless elector. Um, not, not a huge uh, change. Uh, direct popular election, which is probably the, you know, the most uh, uh, common and it won majorities in Congress in 1960, between 1966 and 1969. So it got majorities in both houses, but it didn't get two thirds a majority. And of course, then it would have had to go to the states to get three quarters uh, to, to amend the constitution. Uh, di <clears throat> didn't, didn't, happen, uh, uh, didn't happen there. Um, and there's questions, you know, uh, would there be a minimum uh, percentage to win? Uh, would it be 40%? Uh, Lincoln got about 40%. Others have gotten in the 40s. Uh, not all, all presidents have gotten a popular vote of over 50%. Um, the question though, is, is if, if there's a recount, would this be a problem? Uh, well, I, I, the, the main uh, problem now is that recounts really are important. So if you're in Florida in 2000, uh, 537 votes can make a huge difference. Or if you're in Georgia in 2020, 11,000 uh, 887 votes, whatever it was, uh, was a big deal. Uh, but if you're looking at the whole uh, uh, country, uh, in 2000, you would have had to find five, 500,000 extra votes uh, to turn it you know, from Bush to, uh, <coughs> to Gore. And of course, this year, you'd have to find uh, seven, 7 million. So uh, recounts uh, is, is one thing that have to be decided. But uh, a general election, a popular election would not, that would lessen the problem of the, being things, uh, the vote being so close uh, that you had to do a recount. <clears throat> okay, then in addition to that, that was sort of the, that, that, that's the main one. Uh, there's a proportional plan which would divide electors by a percentage of the state up to fractions and so forth, uh, would take a constitutional amendment, uh, is not, not likely to happen. There's a district plan, <clears throat> and, and as you know, Nebraska and Maine account uh, give. Uh, the uh, elector to each one of the congressional districts and then the two extra to whoever wins the uh, popular vote uh, in the state. Uh, and this would probably make things closer uh, to representing the full uh, vote. The problem is with gerrymandering. Uh, it would increase the, the uh, need for, or, well, the, the incentive for gerrymandering. Uh, for instance, in 2012, uh, President Obama beat Romney by uh, uh, 5 million uh, votes uh, with electoral victory, but if there is a district plan, that is each district uh, counting, uh, you know, el el allocated uh, the electoral votes being uh, allocated by who won the congressional district, um, Romney would have won despite having lost uh, uh, to, uh, by more than five million popular votes. <clears throat> and and then as as we've mentioned, there's this national po uh, popular vote uh, interstate compact, which <clears throat> would take effect. Okay, so this is a uh, each state. Uh, you know, can, can allocate the electoral votes the, the way they want to, uh, as, as has been described. Um, and they, what they could do, and what some of 11 states have done in the District of Columbia, is to say, okay, we're going to allocate all of our electoral votes to whoever wins uh, the popular vote across the whole nation. Um, uh, and there's uh, <laughs> about 11 states have done this, but this would not take effect uh, until enough states to create 270, which would be a majority. Uh, would uh, join. Uh, it, not very likely it's going to happen there. It's, uh, these 11 states in DC uh, represent 165 electoral votes. You need 96 more. Highly unlikely uh, <clears throat> uh, to happen. Uh, this compact uh, would not allow repeal uh, or changes uh, after six months before the election. So uh, the, if the uh, state was going to co uh, comply with the laws that that state had passed, um, uh, they couldn't do a last minute uh, a change unless they, and if they did, they would be violating the laws of the state. And now interstate co uh, uh, compacts are recognized. Um, lots of states do it for different, uh, different reasons. Uh, and there's no compelling reason that this would not, uh, would not work. Because um, all, you know, interstate compacts all uh, take some sort of agreement if the other state, uh, like you know, Virginia and Maryland, if they're going to build a bridge uh, and each was going to put in $50 million to, to do that, uh, 
whether one state puts it in depends on if the other state is going to do it too. Uh, and so th that's the parallel uh, with this uh, interstate <coughs> compact uh, attempt to make sure uh, that the person who gets the most votes is always the person that, that ends up being president, which is the main you know, uh, thrust of uh, people that want to reform the process. But the bottom line is this ain't going to happen. Our discussion is academic in the best sense of the word. Um, in part because it's very difficult to change the status quo in the United States. There's lots of veto points. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to get anything uh, done very, uh, uh, you know, any major change. As I said, constitutional amendment, very difficult to do. Uh, and also, um, Republicans have won the popular vote only once in the last seven elections, the last 30 years. So there's no way that they're going to allow that to, to happen. Our only chance, I think, was in 2004, uh, if John Kerry uh, had uh, if like 60,000 votes or so in Ohio had flipped one way to the other, uh, then Kerry would have won uh, the, the electoral vote but lost the popular vote. And at that point, Republicans and Democrats might have decided, you know, maybe we can have a compromise on this. But the, but the way it is now, uh, there's just uh, no chance that this is gonna go, uh, any of these uh, proposals is gonna go uh, any place. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you all for those comments. I'm going to give the uh, stage to Zach Neely, who will filter questions to our panelists. Right. And I just want to go ahead and echo what Dr. Crockett said earlier and say thank you to all the panelists and thank you to all the attendees uh, for coming to tonight's panel. And so as moderator, I just want to go ahead and lay out a few ground rules for how the panel. Uh, the session is going to go, the Q&A session. Um, Again, to reiterate, um, please put your questions in the Q&A function, not the chat function. Um, uh, you can direct these questions to any specific panelist or to all three, after which, uh, again, I will then pose these questions to the panel, asking any clarifying questions as necessary. I only ask that you all remain civil and keep the chat functions clear of derogatory comments and questions. And as a final note, I want to build on what Dr. Crockett said earlier, and that these guys, it's, these panelists know their stuff. Uh, they're experts, uh, so don't be afraid to pick their brains and hold their feet to the fire. Um, that being said, I'll take moderator's privilege and ask the first question. Uh, this is posed to all panelists, and this is, uh, what do you think about the effort in 2016 uh, to persuade Republican electors to vote for someone other than then President-elect Trump because of his supposed unfitness for office, uh, taking into consideration uh, former President Trump's treatment of the Electoral College in 2020 is the 2016 effort any more legitimate? Well, I think, you know, uh, technically, um, uh, they, uh, electors can vote for whom they want to, but as, as John mentioned, uh, a bunch of states, about 16, have put constraints, and the Supreme Court has said uh, that it's okay for them to, uh, uh, to do that. So if, if the electors decided to do that, they, it would be uh, their own sort of... Uh, uh, expression of what they thought was best, which may have been what the framers wanted, but that's not the way the system uh, <clears throat> works today. Uh, and the only time that the uh, faithless electors would have made much difference, I think in, in 2000, if two or three had changed, it might, it might have flipped it. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, generally, if you say you're going to vote for X, you should vote for X. The others? Zach, if I could jump in, I, I, I pick up what your uh, I think the, the gist of your uh, of your question about the uh, <clears throat> what's behind it at least is yes, this was an effort um, to undermine the democratic uh, the, the the constitutional electoral college process. Right, is to get the electors to vote for someone other than who they were pledged to vote for. Um, and um, so I, I think it is important to remember that uh, we we forget what happened in, in 2016. But on the other hand, and, and this is a, a point we should all remember, I remember being on. Uh, I did so much media that was my moment of actually some very small little bit of fame. Right, um, is uh, when uh, when the a couple of ac some academics and some Hollywood uh, actors came out and started this whole Hamilton elector kind of thing. Right. Um, and it's just laughable because they seem not to understand who the electors were. The Donald Trump elector, just like the Hillary Clinton electors, were diehard party activists. 
Uh, and so they're not going to all of a sudden after the election change their mind and uh, and decide they're going to vote for the other candidate. It's it, it was mind bogglingly uh, ridiculous. Um, and so it was it was never possible is what was going to happen. And what what they ended up doing, actually, it seems to me, is some Clinton actually electors change their change their votes, not for Trump, but they uh, but they changed their vote. And uh, so I think it, say, say it backfired or not, it was never going to go anywhere in the first place. Yeah, so I, I'm going to basically agree, and I think the, the point uh, that both Jim and, and Gary made about the, the way we select electors these days, these are party loyalists and, and are, are really meant to be um, loyal to the, the candidate. And so these, these laws that seek to bind candidates are usually somewhat superfluous because they're, they're really only keeping people from voting, these faithless electors, in very um, uh, sort of protest votes when they don't matter. That's what we've had in the past. If it really mattered they'd be very unlikely to undermine their own candidate. The only thing I will say in addition though, is you know, I was surprised by the Supreme Court's decision this summer. Um, I did not think, I think most people believed they actually if they wanted to reform the electoral college, for example, they couldn't just go at the state level. They, they would have actually had to change the constitution that, that the electors probably do have some discretion formally and legally. They're, they're not likely to vote that way because of their party affiliation and party loyalties, yeah. um, but they, they would have that. Um, and, you know, there are some circumstances where it's not necessarily the best thing to shut them down. I mean, the, the court actually even mentioned it in one small footnote that uh, in the case of, of a candidate's dying before the electors meet, um, you know, we've actually had that in the case of a losing candidate where the electors then could, could vote for someone else of the same party. There's some flexibility there. I don't know that it's necessarily a good thing, but there certainly was some talk about, you know, the, what if there's a third party, um, it was talking about this in both a positive and negative way in 1968, where um, the, the Wallace voters could have made the decision. But on the other hand, there was talk that maybe the Republican and Democratic electors would come together to make sure Wallace wasn't involved. And so you could imagine some situations where there would be some benefit to having flexibility, but you know, rare circumstances. So um, again, I don't think it's illegitimate, um, except in these states, now the court has affirmed for them to vote against the way they're supposed to vote constitutionally. But I do think effectively, because they're party loyalties, they're very, very unlikely to do so. We're all good answers. Thank you all. All right, let's go to the first question from the audience. And it has to do with, uh, with race in the Electoral College. Uh, the first question is, how is race uh, related to Electoral College? And to be more specific, um, is the Electoral College somehow advantageous or dis uh, disadvantageous uh, to certain uh, minority communities like Hispanics, Blacks, Indigenous, and other people of color. I think just a few points at the at the beginning, uh, that was that was the case. Not, uh, I mean, it may or may not be now, but at the beginning, uh, and Madison. I'm, I'm quoting here, uh, and the point is, uh, how do you get the Southern states and the small states to go on, along with the Constitution? And that was the Connecticut Compromise. Uh, and then Madison said that he was in favor of a, a popular vote of you know, the narrow range of people that could vote at that time. But he said, there was one difficulty, however, of a serious nature attending the immediate choice by the people. The right of suffrage was much more diffusive in the Northern than in the Southern states. And the latter could have no influence in the election on the score of the Negroes. But the substitution of electors obviated this difficulty and seemed on the whole to be liable to the fewest objections. So at the beginning, uh, one of the compromises was made in order to get the uh, uh, slave states into the uh, Constitution, or it, yeah, to, to affirm the Constitution uh, and to agree to the Electoral College compromise. But more more recently, there may be other like uh, racial dimensions, uh, Gary or John. Well, I'll I'll jump in and just uh, and given uh, an alternative history uh, since. Uh, uh, Professor Pipner uh, corrected my my history. I'll uh, I'll attempt to jab back uh, maybe because uh, I've been I've been dealing with I think it's Akil Lamar who's made sort of that uh, uh, professor at Yale law professor uh, sort of this argument that the electoral college is wrapped up in slavery, but it's and it's used much more different than uh, uh, Jim just just used it, but it's used as a as an, a, a sledgehammer to beat over the head of the electoral college, which you didn't do, Jim. So I'll say that. But it often, but it has been used that way. I think it's Otamar wants to use it, and some others uh, have used it that way. Um, but the Connecticut Compromise really is about representation in Congress first, right? And so that's the electoral 
math that's on the table that is then used when they create the Electoral College, but it's not math created for the Electoral College. So uh, I, that's it's built into the system. So I think if you're going to use it, and again, you didn't use it that way, but I'd throw it out is people will use it and students here will hear that argument um, is I think it's, it's much more, if you want to use it as a sledgehammer, I would use it against Congress uh, completely. Uh, maybe the House uh, instead of uh, in the three-fifths compromise, et cetera. Uh, but but less so the electoral the electoral college, more contemporary. Then I'll let uh, uh, if John has anything to say. I don't have a lot to say about that. I don't know exactly. I've done a study about race uh, in the electoral college, um, but to the degree that minority populations tend to be centered in major urban areas, and then to the degree that there is a slight. Um, benefit in the system, current electoral college system to rural small state areas, Wyoming or something like that, to that degree, you can argue that there is uh, less representation maybe for uh, minority communities in the electoral college than you would if you just counted up all the votes uh, individually, I think. But again, that's, uh, that's not my specialty. But. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I should go over all the same ground that both uh, Jim and, and Gary have gone over. But you know, I, I do think it's true that, that obviously the decisions we made about um, making our government uh, came before deciding how to, how to select the president. And so a lot of the, the compromise that we made, obviously we, we retained slavery, we had the three-fifths compromise, we had the way of representing the states in Congress uh, before the electoral college was, was developed, which was developed later in the Constitutional Convention. So, you know, it's related to these decisions, but but I, I think the Amars even and Mar and some of these people have backed off that a bit as, as saying it was the reason that that was was put in. Um, you know, I guess the the other thing to note, and it, this doesn't always uh, play in a race, but just you know, it is a state based system, and and we we again seeing this question about whether to challenge the votes of the states. That we, we do allow states to have very different great differences as to how they hold elections, of course. There were terrible, terrible differences that affected race for, for much of our history, both literally slavery and, 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 and the discriminatory regimes that, that happened uh, for long afterwards. Uh, today, we tend to talk about more of the differences of voting systems, but you know, some of those implicate race. And people argue, well, you know, are, are certain ways that states hold elections um, more favorable than others? And so you know, we, allow, we allow variety. And if you think some, some systems aren't as good as others, and you think we could have a better national system, maybe you could say it, it, um, you know, it implicates race in, in certain ways. You know, I guess the last thing is, and, and Gary got to this, is um, certainly for a while, the Southern states being very Republican, where you know, Southern states are the most African-American states, and African-Americans were in the minority in states, and, and for a while, Republicans had a pretty strong lock on almost all the, uh, the Democratic states. But you see with, um, Georgia, Virginia, North Carolina being very close, Florida's uh, pretty, you know, still pretty close. You know that 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 African American voters who are in those states, uh, presidential election might be voting for the winner, or might be voting for the loser. Whereas it was a little more monolithically Republican, at least for an era of, you know, twenty or thirty years. And and you know things do change. The swing states change in the electoral college. That's one thing to remember. It's not always going to be the same states we're we're, we're uh, fighting over. While we're on the subject of race, um, now two of y'all have mentioned uh, the issue of slavery. And there's another question in the chat that relates to this. And so this question is directed to uh, Dr. Greg. Um, how would you respond to the claim that one of the primary outputs the founders are concerned about, because uh, you've talked about outputs in your presentation, uh, was the maintenance of slavery? And what does that mean for the legitimacy of the Electoral College? Uh, yeah, I think I, I would stand by what uh, my argument before is, um, you know, I don't think it's um, uh, the Electoral College has, frankly, anything to do with slavery uh, and the outputs of presidents that would be pro-slavery or something. I don't think it has anything to do with that. Uh, again, the system is using the math built into the system. So if you argue that the House was created the representation of the House of Representatives was created to defend slavery. Okay, then maybe then maybe you can then move that over to the Electoral College. But I don't think you can argue that the Electoral College in any way is connected uh, is connected to slavery. 
And in fact, um, when, um, you know, James Madison, Professor Pifter mentioned uh, that long and good quote from James Madison there. When Madison, um, one of the pieces of, uh, of evidence that uh, Akhil Amar and some others have used is the, is the quote from, from Madison. But when you put him, when he says, you know, it'd be good for the South, when he says it at the Constitutional Convention, he's actually responding to a proposal an electoral college kind of proposal. He's not talking about the electoral college at that point because we don't have it yet. But I, I think it's that. I think it's in May, maybe when he uh, when he says this, um, and we don't get that until you know into September. But the um, is he's responding to an idea put on the table by an abolitionist. Actually, a New Jersey abolitionist puts out this idea of maybe this kind of elector kind of thing. And Madison says, huh, well, might not be bad for the South either. So anyway, you have to, uh, there's some stretching and, and twisting going on in my estimation to connect it in any way with, uh, with the defense of slavery. And, and I, just to add to that, I think um, President Obama was elected twice, uh, Kamala Harris is vice president now. Uh, so that's an argument against a, a, a sort of a specific, uh, uh, against the outcome of having say African-Americans uh, in the White House. All right, um, we'll head to another question. Uh, this is one a little more general, and uh, this is about the, you know, what would happen if the Electoral College were abolished, in your opinion? Please. Well, it would depend on what, what took its place, really, and there are these different um, uh, the scenarios. Uh, and the main thing, I think, is if, if you had a national popular vote, the runner-up uh, which happened five times in our history, uh, would not end up being president. Uh, but at least that's the intention. But of course, uh, there's always unintended consequences that, that go along with uh, these things. So for most of our history, uh, the Electoral College just reaffirmed uh, what the popular vote was, except for those five times. Uh, and if it was replaced, it would depend on what it was replaced uh, with. Yeah, I, I uh, will say a couple of things. One, um... No, it's, it's not absolutely clear because uh, the candidates and parties would run different types of elections if we moved to that system. But if we did have a national popular vote, one thing I think we would lose, and some people think it's a good thing and some people think it's a bad thing, is the diversity of ways in which we run elections in the states. Um, in theory, you could have the states have these different rules and still have a national popular vote uh, total. But I think the pressure would be very strong to say we have to have a uniform system. And so if you if you're from Oregon and you like 100% voting by mail, which they do, that's, you know, today one state can have that and other states can look very different. Um, you know, some people think that that would be a good thing. We'd have a national set of rules. Um, I'm not sure they all know what those national set of rules would be and what we'd agree on. Uh, but, you know, our history is that we have this very strong federals and very strong differences in the way we run elections in the states. And there's some benefit to that. So you, you, would, you would probably lose that. Um, you know, the other thing is that Jim mentioned the... Um, national popular vote initiative, this compact or the indirect way of getting to the, uh, the national popular vote. It basically keeps all the electoral college machinery, but it says states, um, enough, if enough states get together and say, we're gonna throw our, our electors to the winner of the national popular vote rather than the winner of our state. Um, that would, if enough states agree, that would effectively get you the national popular vote. But, you know, I think there would be some, it would be a bit of a halfway house. You'd have questions about, well, we can't have a recount nationally. We can only have a recount in states that are close. And, uh, you know, some states, you wonder whether they would pull out of it or not, or maybe there's this compact, maybe that would hold them. But if California voted for, as it did, voted for Joe Biden, but Donald Trump won the national popular vote, you think California would be excited about casting their votes for, for Donald Trump. So, you know, I think there would be some question as to would it settle and how would it work? And, you know, I think for the most part it would work because most elections aren't that controversial. Um, some have been recently, but it, you know, it does raise the question of being kind of a halfway house between a pure national popular vote and the electoral college machinery. If I, we could talk for five hours um, uh, about, about this question, I think, and talk about all the nuances, but uh, and hopefully we'll get to talk about more. I'll just make a couple of quick points. One is I think it would change everything and depends. And uh, um, Jim is absolutely right. It depends on what you put in, put in its place uh, is, is a huge question. 
Um, but I think it would be a national popular vote because I don't think there's anything else that could possibly um, fit America in the 21st century. So um, it would change absolutely everything, right? Our entire campaign structure is based upon the Electoral College and winning 270 electors. The entire campaign, every decision from who is your candidate to uh, how are you, uh, what are you spending money and how or are you traveling to? Or where you, where, what issue, if you're in your basement in Delaware, what issues are you talking about from your basement in Delaware if you're not actually traveling there during a pandemic, right? Um, everything changes. So if you think about 2016, you think about the last days of the campaign in 2016, Donald Trump is in North Raleigh, I think, North Carolina. He's in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He's around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, right? Um, and Hillary Clinton's very similar, uh, similarly. If you throw that off and you go to a national popular vote, simple national popular vote, you got no candidates in Grand Rapids, Michigan, for crying out loud, or even Raleigh, North Carolina, particularly at the end of a campaign, right? It's all changed. The other point I want to say about that is that um, uh, Professor Pifter mentioned, you know, five times in American history, the loser of the national popular vote became president. Let's keep this in mind. There is really no legal national vote. This is a this is a fiction. This doesn't really exist. We count them up, us political scientists and the AP and whatever. And we do that. But these are statewide elections. Right. Secondly, no campaign has ever been run to win the national popular vote. So, yes, the, our, uh, Hillary Clinton won the national popular vote, whatever the heck that is, in 2016. But guess what? She didn't try to. And Donald Trump didn't try to win the national popular vote. So I think when we do that, we got to keep that in mind is we don't know what those races would have actually looked like if you had a national popular vote. We just don't know. Donald Trump could have won that by looking at this election just this year, 70, what, 75 million votes. Wow. Potentially, he could have won a national uh, national election based on that in 2016 if he'd have run the campaign differently. So we just we just don't know. It's going to change everything. We could talk for the next three hours about all the all the potential changes down the down the line. But I just want everybody to think, don't take it whatever side you're going to land on. Don't assume it doesn't matter. Don't assume it's an easy answer. Uh, assume you're, if you're voting to change the Electoral College or to keep it or whatever, you're making a very important substantive decision for the future of the American Republic. And this is just a short follow-up, um, but taking into consideration your answers. Um, if feasibility wasn't an issue in reforming or abolishing the Electoral College, would that change your opinion on abolishing the Electoral College if it wasn't an issue? What do you mean by feasibility? As in the logistics of having to get rid of it, pretty much. Oh, so like the uh, what Dr. Uh, Professor Kripner said, it was, it was like almost impossible to get through the constitutional hurdles. Is that what you mean? Yeah, because I think one of y'all had mentioned that, you know, there's just the idea of having to replace it and just having to get past that, again, would abolish an electoral college in, in, I think one of the popular proposals is to do, you know, a national vote where whoever wins takes, or wins the national vote, wins the presidency. So feasibility was an issue in having to move from electoral college to one of the proposals that, for example, Dr. Uh, Pifner talked about earlier. Would that change your opinion? Jack, Zach, you just opened a three-hour floodgate, so I'll let uh, I'll let somebody <laughs> else go. <laughs> I, th I think the main argument is that the runner-up shouldn't become president, uh, and uh, there are several ways to do this, as I mentioned. But uh, as Gary mentioned, there's no way to really predict what would happen because, and as John mentioned, campaigns would be run uh, differently, uh, and the and so the main probably a purpose of this would to make sure that the person who got the most votes ended up being president, uh, but it could change all sorts of other things, the dynamics as both, both of my colleagues have said. Look, I mean, if we were starting from scratch, I think most American, in fact, polls show most Americans would not go to what we have, would, would have some sort of national popular vote. Um, you know, the one thing that holds me back is that I think we have deeply baked into our system that we are, especially in electoral sense, um, a collection of states and we allow states to do different things and 
we don't have any congressional districts that cross states. Um, people, you know, get elected in a place. Uh, and so there, there is something, uh, I think that's one of the reasons things would change dramatically if we moved to the national popular vote, partly because of the campaigns being different, but partly, you know, you wouldn't think about winning places. You wouldn't think about winning majorities in, in states that are places that you got, you know, that, that are governed by elected officials. And so I, I think it's just a big change. And I guess um, each system has its disadvantages. And again, if we were starting from scratch and we didn't have this his history of that, but I, I do think that uh, people more than you think um, like the way they vote in their states, select their state officials and understand an election that is about winning in their states. And, and for that reason, I think it's, you know, it, it has some value. Zach, you really did have opened up a, a can of worms and we're, we're all being very disciplined on this. So that's good. We'll be <laughs> um, yeah. I've been fighting, I've been fighting for 20 years on the, uh, on, on this. So I'm not a neutral observer on this. I've made up my mind a long time ago on the electoral college. Doesn't mean I won't change at some point, but, um, and I think it's a, uh, I think the electoral college is vital to the future of American, uh, uh, the American Republic. Uh, I think you throw it off and you change absolutely everything in ways that we don't know what's going to be the result. Um, let me just give you a couple of quick, uh, maybe a really quick examples, uh, focus on a couple. Uh, one is, um, do we value, which I value competitive elections. Um, I value it a lot. Well, we know we get very competitive elections under the electoral college. Will we at the national direct popular? But I don't know. We can't say we will. We can't say we, both parties actually got a shot at it. And both sides, we, we can see right now what's happening in America where part of the country thinks they were screwed, right? You set up a system where part of the country thinks they're permanently screwed. We're in big trouble, right? I think we're in big trouble on that. So if you look at this uh, electoral college, it gives us elections like this. Let's go back to 1952, try to do it real quick. The elections go like this, Republican, Republican, Democrat, Democrat. Republican, Republican, Democrat, Republican, 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 Democrat, Democrat, Republican, Republican, Democrat, Democrat, Republican, Democrat. That's awesome, as far as I'm concerned, right? Both sides can win. You throw that off, is one side going to start rolling the table election after election after election? I don't know, and I don't want to risk it. Second thing is, I, I'm from Kentucky, I'm from a small state. Um, but I'm, I value the diversity that the Electoral College gives us, and that is candidates have to pay attention to rural voters. Candidates have to pay attention to the diversity in the country to win the electors, because they got to win states, and they got to win some small states, some rural states. Here's a quick statistic for you. Joe Biden won in a landslide. I'm sorry if you, if you guys are, are Trump people out there and you don't, you don't buy the, the, the numbers, the numbers are massive. Joe Biden won 7 million more votes than Donald Trump, right? Think about it, 7 million more votes than Donald Trump. Guess what? 5 million of those came from California alone. 2 million of those came from New York alone. There's all 7 million of Joe Biden's margin of victory in two states. In, 2000, in 2016, Hillary Clinton won 2 million, or was it 3 million votes uh, more than Donald Trump? Every single one of those marginal voters came in California. Donald Trump won the entire country except California, but she swamped him by 60 some percent of the vote in California, got 2 million extra votes just in Los Angeles itself. I don't know about you, but being out here in LaGrange, Kentucky, it scares me that a candidate could try and plop down in New York, because they didn't go. And those, neither one of those candidates went to New York. Neither one of those candidates went to California except to raise money. But if they actually tried, go out there, maximize the votes, I'm not sure that uh, rural voters, small states actually matter anymore in presidential elections. Um, and I don't think we want a country where you have a big chunk of the country thinking they really don't count anymore. Just a, a point on, on the competitive part. Uh, right now, the only competition uh, is in the swing states, uh, and Kentucky is is pretty red. Uh, I don't think there's many candidates that are going to be going and in, in, in campaigning right. in Kentucky because it's pretty solid a Republican. Um, uh, so, and it, as far as being in trouble, I think we're already in, in big trouble for the reason. <laughs> Touche. 
All right, let's go with a couple of uh, very simple yes or no questions. I'll test y'all's discipline. Uh, see how we can <laughs> stick to that. Yeah. Well, we'll see it. No. We'll try it. Um, in your view, is the National Popular Vote Compact constitutional? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I think uh, there aren't compelling arguments against it. I think they're, you know, interstate compacts. Oh, sorry. I guess <laughs> one word. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a one word. I, I will say the it's based on a truism that states have the ability to determine how their electors are selected. Um, but I, I do think some of the, the, the questions of the compacts and the sort of smaller issues are, are questionable. And I, I'm not decided on this, but some, I think there's some who argue that states have to somehow determine the election on what people in their state said, not, not outside the state. Um, I'm not sure I'm totally persuaded by that election, but you can think about a state saying, well, we'll throw our vote to the, you know, to the, the candidate who uh, is closest to the oldest candidate or the, or the, the youngest candidate or, or, you know, some arbitrary criterion. So, or do they, do they really have to do something based on what their state says? And um, so that's an argument, but, um, so I, I don't know, but I think there's a constitutional insight there that states have the ability to, to uh, determine what happens to their electors. I think that's a strong bit of information in favor of it. Is it a good idea? Or do you like the idea of a vote compact? Probably not. Yes, as long as there's no problems. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be on a no side. One, I'm, I'm not sure we should be going that way in general. And two, I think the halfway house problem is uh, would lead to some, some issues, and I don't know that they're completely resolvable. Would you amend the Electoral College if given the chance, just broadly speaking? Just anything, if you want to change anything about it, if you got the chance, yes or no? <laughs> Now that was harder. Uh, let me say, let me say, yes, um, you could eliminate the role of the elector, I think, without messing up anything else I'm concerned about. Yes is my answer. I think there are some things, yeah, or, and also some laws that could be changed, uh, which relate to it, but. All right, let's move to another question. This one's not yes or no, so you can, uh, <laughs> you can elaborate on the answers a little bit. Um, we can do what if, we've been doing anyway. <laughs> if alternatives to electoral college are so extremely unlikely to be implemented, how democratic is our system? Even if the system itself has a democratic nature, if the system itself can't be altered, is it still democratic? Alternatively, how large of an effort would be required to enact systematic change? How many government officials would need to be involved, interest groups, etc.? So I'll, I'll say one thing I mentioned in my, my, the latest edition of After the People Vote, there's a chapter on uh, public opinion. Carlin Bowman wrote a sort of very comprehensive chapter of every poll that's ever been done about the Electoral College, essentially. And look, it's been pretty consistent that a majority has been against it or for national popular vote for a long time. But, um, you know, we make it difficult to amend our constitution. Maybe, maybe some people think it's too difficult, but it should be somewhat difficult. And uh, it's both a question of getting to the certain majorities, but also having an intensity and really, really wanting to do it. I mean, after 2000, there were other things that people cared about, you know, fixing our ballot um, voting machines and other things. And, and that this wasn't probably the highest priority. Um, on the na national popular vote is easier. It's a lower threshold. If you were to do that, it doesn't require you know, two thirds in Congress and three quarters of the states. It requires you know, this certain number of states that adds up to 270 electors. But there, I think the difference is what you're seeing is more or less blue states are adopting this, although a couple of, a couple of small blue states have resisted, which is interesting, but more or less blue states have, have been for it, red states generally against it. And you know, it's gonna have to move into the, at least the purple states and, and a little bit into the red states to, to, to get that 270 majority. And you know, it probably should be that way. If it was just one party that wanted to change it that way, I think it would be, it would be hard to, you know, I wouldn't want our system to be changing as radically as would change parties in, in who's in who's in charge of government. I'd want it to be harder than that. 
I think that uh, it's pretty clear that the framers did not intend to create a democracy. Uh, they created a constitutional republic. Uh, Federalists 10 and 51 explain why direct democracy is problematical. I think those arguments are good. I think it's important that we have the Senate and, and the House uh, and federalism and so forth. Uh, the one thing, though, that I would be in favor of is uh, the popular vote for, for the president, which is more of a democratic thing, but it's the, the, the overall constitution is not intended to be a pure democracy. Support everything Jim, Jim just said, brilliant, except, uh, except the, the popular vote part, but everything else, absolutely right. You know, this, uh, our system is supposed to be a constitutional republic, and that means changing the constitution is not at the whim of a simple majority of any given one time. Uh, it's not democratic in that way. But what I would also say is, to me, I think our system is, the Electoral College is democratic as well, because it's just the way you count. And we count by 50 in the states. So every state runs a democratic election. Every vote is counts as one man, one vote in the, in the states and the District of Columbia. We just don't add them all up and do it uh, at the national level. So I think it's democratic. Uh, it's just a way of being democratic. Um, and, uh, well, I already said about the Constitution, so. Yeah, and let's go ahead and go to one final question. Um, there are actually several questions that uh, deal with uh, rank choice voting. Um, so in that, in that vein, um, do y'all believe that rank choice voting could be implemented with the current system as it is? And could that potentially benefit third parties, um, which are at a bit of a disadvantage right now with the way the system is set up? I think rank choice voting is, <clears throat> is a good idea, but I think it's too complicated to explain to people that they wouldn't understand it. Uh, I think it would benefit third parties in that people would get uh, have the opportunity to give uh, <clears throat> make a symbolic vote. Like for instance, uh, in 2016, uh, 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 um, the Green Party, uh, uh, Stein, uh, people, uh, the, the number of votes for her was larger than the gap between Clinton uh, and Trump. <clears throat> and so if they would have had voted for, for Clinton, she'd be uh, president. A ranked choice would give the people an opportunity uh, to, to make a symbolic vote because they'd re re either, you know, uh, libertarian or uh, green or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> and then their second choice would add up uh, to uh, until one of the primary candidates uh, got a majority. So I, I think in the abstract, it's a good idea, but I think practically uh, too complicated. Yeah, I'm, I'm not for ranch choice voting and uh, there are a lot of complicated reasons. I mean, I think one of them is that it promises everything to everybody that promises both, we can have lots of parties, but we also get this majority vote. And I think it's, you know, it's very unclear how it's gonna settle and look, you know, different countries that do it settles in different ways. And, you know, I, I would worry about it. Um, I, you just. Technically, to your question, we, we do have some element of ranked choice voting related to the election now, the presidential election. Maine um, has been using it at the state level and now at the presidential level. Uh, and so you do have uh, a state doing it. Alaska is now moving. And I don't think, I actually don't know if they moved to it for the presidential vote. They're, they're definitely moving to it for their state votes and their senatorial votes. Um, so, uh, you know, it is, it is around. And, and as states, if they were to adopt them, it, it could be incorporated as part of the electoral college machinery because we allow states to do very different things. And, you know, I, I don't think we're going to move there uh, in, a, in a national way, but I, I guess I could see some other states moving that way. And that is one of the, I think, advantage of the electoral college. It allows a little bit of play in the joints that states have some, some ability to, to set up their own state elections the way they, they'd like, uh, and they may not be the same as others. I, I honestly have not. Uh, this comes up all the time. And for whatever, I'm resistant to actually seriously think through it. So I think because of what Jim said is it's so complicated. And I don't think there's any the way where America is right now, you're either going to keep the system or you're going to have a direct national popular vote. I think there's no there's no in between kind of thing on the impact on the elect on on um, third parties. I think the way the way the system is set up so that um, winner take all in the states, the unit rule. That's really what this, what really undermines third party uh, third party attraction. And so, unless you change that, unless you let a third party win a vote, maybe in in Kentucky or California, I don't think you're gonna you're gonna see a, any kind of change substantially. Maybe in the in the symbolic votes you'll get, like Jim said, but substantially you're not gonna help the uh, 
you're not going to help the uh, third parties. Let me let me end by just saying this: you want rank voting and um, uh, what have you. It might be a place I think where we need to think about reform is the is the primary system. I'm not an expert on it, but it seems to me that Joe Biden and Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are not the three greatest people in America to uh, to be president. It seems like there's got to be somebody else better than one of those those three. But our but our primary system is creating a world where we get those candidates. I would rather see us figure it out and get better candidates beforehand and then let us have a, a real national debate between two two great champions uh who will uh or more uh who, who are wise and virtuous and patriotic and will serve the common good i think gary's uh, absolutely right on that and the key for third parties in the united states we've got single member districts winner take all the plurality wins third parties just don't have a chance to get anybody uh in, in congress mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Crockett, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, let's do one last one. All right, let's see. Uh, okay, let's do one. Okay, so why do you think that pundits and academics who otherwise prefer European political institutions to American institutions, nevertheless are those who push hardest for a national popular vote. Shouldn't they want something stronger than electoral college? For example, legislative selection of the executive and not something so susceptible to demagogic forces like popular vote. Hmm. Well, parliamentary systems, I mean, it's, it's clearly a different uh, way of running a country. There isn't an independent executive. Uh, it's more democratic in the sense that if you've got a majority uh, in the parliament, uh, you can, run things through. There are not the sorts of checks and balances uh, that we have in the United States. Uh, and it's a really different system. There's a large literature on uh, comparing the two and the outcomes and so forth that you can look into it if you want to. But it's really different and the United States is, is not about to do it. Yeah, so I would add that, um, you know, uh, the, one argument against the Electoral College, and it's partly true, is that there's an inequality of the vote. So the person from a small state has a little bit more of a say per capita. Uh, than a large state, um, but it's nothing compared to the Senate, for example. The Senate is, is uh, very unequal in the terms of the population of the states. The Electoral College only reflects just a tiny bit of that. Um, so if you were really looking to change things uh, in that way, you know, I, 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 I do think you probably would want to focus your efforts more on, on the Senate if you were looking to amend the Constitution, make things more equal. You know, the, the other odd thing I'll just note about parliamentary systems, at least ones that have uh, winner take all systems in, in districts, which some of them do in the UK and others, is that you know, there's something of an element of the electoral college in that, or at least uh, you, could, you could win the prime ministership without winning the popular vote. Uh, if you add up all the votes of all the members, uh, that doesn't always add up to a majority. It's a, it really, the main reason we sometimes have that in the electoral college is not because of the slight inequality of the Senate in the, in the electoral college, it's because of winner take all, that you can win some states by a lot, like Gary mentioned that the Democrats have been winning California by a lot, uh, and then other states are won more narrowly. So, you know, I, I, certain parliamentary systems at least uh, would reflect that as well. I don't have much to, uh, much to add, or any, really anything to add to, to that on parliament and, uh, and academic, uh, I'm one, but I don't think I understand this. But the, um, let me just, you, you said the word demagogic, uh, and I think that's another word like, like deliberation. I was trying to throw on the table earlier. We should think about deliberation uh, a little more in this country. Demagoguery, demagogic, demagogic leaders. We need to think about that a little more. Uh, I've been fighting that battle for 20 years. Finally, people are who knows why in uh, January of 2021, but coming around to seeing the danger of, of a demagogic leader. And, uh, and, and that kind of demagogic rhetoric. And it's not just one candidate, though. You know, the founders cr wanted to create a system. If you think about the way I laid out the Electoral College in the beginning, not based on uh, can candidates going around begging and pleading for votes. In fact, just the actually opposite of that. Uh, we're not going to get around to that. But I think if we think about that, it might warn us against some tactics uh, that our polit would be ambitious politicians would use. Um, that I think it would help us to, uh, uh, to remember, think about. 
Very good. Well, I just want to thank Dr. Greg and Dr. Fortier and Dr. Piffner for sharing your knowledge and insights. It was an excellent discussion and looking at how many questions are still remaining. We could probably do this for another hour or two, but we're only human beings. I'm sure everyone knows a whole lot more now about this system than they thought uh, just 90 minutes ago. And it's the kind of scholarly inquiry that helps cut through the fog that's too often created by the partisan media and self-serving political leaders. So I wanna thank uh, Zach for a great work sifting through some interesting and difficult questions. Thanks to the larger Trinity community for your attention and great questions. And on behalf of Trinity University, I wish everyone a pleasant evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice guys, great conversation.